So for this, um, let's say, short lecture, we are going to discuss <coughs> what we call the Raleigh Ritz method. Both for buckling and for finding static uh, deflections. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do know that the equilibrium conditions for, for a plate can be found in the absence of implying loads from taking, setting the variation of the total potential energy to be equal to zero, where the potential energy V sub E is the potential energy due to externally applied pressure. And this is a linear functional in displacement because we have E is a minus integration over the plate of Q W dx dy, while U is a quadratic function of displacements and it's equivalent equal to integration over the domain of d w x x squared plus w y y squared plus blah blah and more terms and these expressions we have derived in detail okay <coughs> so when we take the variation this means that we allow the displacements to change arbitrarily. So any possible change in displacement, any arbitrary um, variable displacement is, is, is admitted as long as it is consistent with the boundary conditions. And when we do that and integrate by parts, we are able to find the partial differential equation and boundary conditions. So what happens if we cannot solve the partial differential equation and boundary conditions, which is the most usual case because a fourth order partial differential equation is very difficult to solve. In that case, um, Raleigh and Ritz separately suggested the following procedure. We assume that the displacement W is a sum of some unknown coefficients, let's call them E, capital E sub I, times <coughs> some what we call assumed shape functions or assumed functions. These are functions, known functions of x and y. So we assume them and we sum over i. And we usually terminate the sum at a finite number of terms. We might even, if we're not... <coughs> <coughs> If we are not very ambitious, we might actually limit ourselves to only a single term. So what we do is, con if you start talking now about delta W, you will see that if you assume your displacement is a linear combination of these uh, assumed functions or assumed shapes, these are known. So you cannot assume that your virtual displacements will contain delta phi because there is no, no meaning for delta phi. Phi is not an arbitrary unknown function. It is an actual known function. So from here, delta w is changes in A only because the only unknowns are the coefficients phi i x comma y. Yeah. <clears throat> so what this means, but since the delta A's are finite, so actually changes in A are simple differentials. So from there, we can interpret the original principle that it changes from delta U plus V equals zero to a minimization with respect to a bunch of algebraic coefficients, which is a finite number of them, 
So which is equivalent to partial U plus VE over partial AI equals zero. And this will give us um, always the same number of unknowns as <coughs> the same number of equations as we have unknowns, because we differentiate with respect to each one of the unknowns to get one of the equations. And this is the Raleigh Ritz method. So essentially, all what you need to do is you take an assumption of your displacement as a linear combination of known functions with unknown coefficients, substitute into your total potential energy, you get an algebraic function of these coefficients, you differentiate this with respect to each one of the coefficients set it equal to zero, and then you get a system of equations for your unknown coefficients. Okay, this sounds very easy, but it can be even made easier, as we're going to see in a second. Remember that, for example, our VE is minus integration Q, W is nothing other than summation over I, A, I, V, I, D, X, D, Y. The A, I are constants, <coughs> so they can be pulled out of the integration. You can always exchange integration and summation because they are both linear operators. So from here, you can write, oh, this is nothing other than minus summation AI integration Q VI DX DY. And these integrals we can easily compute because VI are known functions of X and Y. We choose them from the get-go. And Q is the known applied pressure. So these functions are known. We can find these integrals. And these integrals we're going to call f sub i. So you can always write ve to be minus summation over i f i a i. Or if you write f in a vector, this is nothing other than f transpose a. Yeah? <coughs> With a minus sign where A is a vector of unknowns, and F is a vector of constants that we find by integration. And the formula is simply that Fi is integration over the plate domain Q, which is function of x and y, times our assumed functions Ti of x, y, dx, dy. And interpretation is very simple. Fi is the work done by the pressure on the shape function phi. Yeah, it's very simple. <coughs> OK. What about strain energy? Strain energy is quadratic in displacements. So it will turn out to be also a quadratic in the unknown coefficients. So let us take a look at the, for example, the first term Let us take a look at the first term here of our uh, strain energy function You have one half integration d w x x squared d x d y. If w is summation over i a i phi i, then w x x is summation over i a sub i e i comma x x yeah the differentiation of the sum is the sum of differentiation because differentiation is a linear operator no problems so 
from there, what you do is you can write this now as one half integration of d. Wxx squared is Wxx times Wxx. So the first Wxx is just summation ai phi xx. And the second Wxx will, instead of summing over i, will sum over j. Of course, since it is a summation index, it doesn't make any difference. Somebody might ask, why do we do this? And the reason we do this is that you are not allowed to have a summation index repeating twice in an expression. Okay, then you will get yourself confused, nothing more, nothing less. Okay, the multiplication of two sums can be turned into a double sum of the multiplication of the summons. So we can easily write this as one half integration d summation over i and j. Yeah, so it's a double sum. Or if you want to be more uh, precise, you can write it as summation over i, summation over j, phi i x x, phi j x x, k i k j, t x d y. <clears throat> and this can be written as u equals one half a transpose k times a because this form here is just a quadratic form and we if you remember the early mathematics we uh, reviewed a quadratic form always corresponds to a symmetric matrix k. And the general expression for k will be integration over the domain d. And then the first term is going to be phi xx times phi jxx. And there will be more terms. The full expression is given already in the summary presentation already uh, on Blackboard. So this would be Kij. And this is a symmetric matrix. And it would be positive definite, of course, because energy cannot be negative. So what we end up with is that our total potential energy is a quadratic in the unknown coefficients. And can be written in this form. So if we differentiate this with respect to the unknowns a, and write the result in vector form, we'll find that partial u, partial v e, partial a, is nothing other than k times a minus s. If we equate this to 0, we find that we end up with a famous equation k a equals f. These forces here are called generalized forces. And this is called the stiffness matrix because it represents the stiffness of the structure. And we're done. So the Rolleritz method is very simple. <coughs> you assume a shape for displacements. Then you compute the elements of k and f. And these are straightforward integrations. Then now you have a linear system. 
you solve it, you find the coefficients. Once you have the coefficients, then you know an approximate solution for the displacements. Of course, the more terms you use, the more accurate uh, would be the final solution you are going to obtain. All right, so we do have an example here uh, to uh, to demonstrate, and we're going to use a single term uh, roller ridge solution in order to demonstrate what we can do with this method. What we will have here is a plate that has the shape of a right triangle and both side lengths are equal to 1. And it is simply supported along all edges. So simply supported on all edges. <coughs> And loading is uniform pressure. Q not. So, how do we proceed? Of course, it's simply supported, but on a triangular region. So we cannot use the Navier solution because the Navier solution applies for rectangles. And with triangles, usually the hope of an exact solution is quite small, if not vanishing. So we approach this in a practical way and say, OK, let us see if we can get an approximate solution. And the simplest approximate solution we can find is with a single assumed shape function. So the first question is, what type of shape functions we need to, to choose? What are the constraints? Can we just choose anything? Because these shape functions don't only define the possible shape of the plate, but also possible virtual displacements, then they should be um, respectful of <coughs> the boundary conditions. So if you have a simply supported plate, we do know two things about simple supported plates. That the displacement is zero, and the moment resultant in the direction normal to the edge is zero. Of course, you can easily imagine that on the tilted edge, it's not going to be that mx is zero or my is zero. It will be a combination of mx, my, and mxy, because you're talking about m around an axis which is perpendicular here, which is not x or y. So it will be a combination of everything that has to be zero. But we don't have to worry about the moment conditions, because we are starting from the principle of minimum total potential energy. And for that principle, we needed only to worry about geometric constraints. So essentially, we need to satisfy only constraints on displacements and rotations. We don't have to worry about con conditions that need to be satisfied on bending moments or on shear forces. And as such, the only conditions we need to satisfy is that along all edges, the displacement should be equal to 0. So any function with 0 value along all three edges will work. So what would be the easiest function uh, to propose. The easiest function to propose would be simply multiplying the equations of the three lines forming the boundaries. So for example, the horizontal boundary is given by an equation that says y equals 0. So this is boundary number 1. Boundary number 2, which is the vertical boundary here, is given by an equation that says x equals 0. 
<coughs> and then the diagonal edge of the plate is given by an equation that says that x plus y equals 1, which we can write it as x plus y minus 1 would be equal to 0. So if we multiply all three, we can assume w to be e constant, a. We can call it a1, of course, but there is only one of them, so we don't have to subscript it. x times y times, I'm going to write it in the form 1 minus x minus y, so that displacement is positive inside the plate. <coughs> So automatically, on any one of these three edges, one of the three terms is going to be equal to 0. And from that, automatically, w will be equal to 0. So we satisfy all boundary conditions. And then we multiply by an unknown constant. And this is the only unknown we have. If we're going to assume a single, of course, single function, if we want to assume more functions, we can go to higher order polynomials. Again, satisfying all these uh, boundary conditions. So there is nothing uh, too complicated about that. And of course, as you can easily imagine, as we take more and more terms in our polynomial expansion, then we will get better and better accuracy. But also, we will have to do more work. OK, so <coughs> now once we have the expression for the displacement, we can, so this is going to be our phi of x and y, where phi is the assumed shape function. So what we need to calculate now is the derivatives of the assumed function. So we need phi x x which is 2 times the derivative with respect to x. <coughs> you can easily see that this is a quadratic in x. So second order derivative with respect to x is going to be a constant in x. That's a trick, which means that it can still depend on y. It will end up being minus 2 times y, phi y y. Again, this is quadratic in y, and it will come out to be minus 2 times x. And then we have the mixed derivative. <coughs> so the first term, x times y, will give you 1. If you have x squared y, it will give you minus 2x, y squared x will give you minus 2y. So this is our uh, twist uh, of the plate. So now with these, <coughs> we know phi itself. We know second order derivatives, which appear in the expression of string energy. Then we can start evaluating our k, which is going to be a scalar because it's a one by one matrix, and our f. So for example, f is going to be integration over the plate <coughs> of q, which is just a constant, times phi, which is just x, y, 1 minus x minus y dx dy. So the question now is, what would be the limits of integration. Wh whenever you do double integrals, you have to decide whether you're going to integrate first with respect to x, and then with respect to y, or first with respect to y, and then with respect to x. If you're going to start by integrating with respect to x, followed by integration with respect to y, this is equivalent to working with what people call a horizontal strip. So for a given y, you first integrate with respect to x, which would give you the area of a horizontal strip here. And then you sum over all these strips 
in y direction. So you will see here the integration with respect to x is going to always start from x equals 0, which is boundary number 2. And it will end on boundary number 3, which is x equals 1 minus y. Because boundary number 3, the equation is x plus y minus 1 equals 0, so x equals 1 minus y. And then when you sum over y, you will integrate essentially from 0 to 1. So that would be our integration. <coughs> Doing the integration here, this will be 0 to 1. We can always pull Q0 out. Integrating with respect to x, you have y times x squared over 2 minus x cubed will give you x to the 4 over 4 minus y times x will give you y x squared over 2 from 0 to 1 minus y dy. Of course, you substitute expand. Then you end up with a straightforward integration with respect to y. And at the end, <coughs> you should be able to find that <coughs> your f is equal to q0 over 120. If you do the corresponding integration for k, which is, again, with the same limits, but a more involved uh, integral that involves the second derivatives, you will find at the end that k is going to be d over 3 times 2 plus nu, where nu is Poisson's ratio. And from there, you write k a equals f, and this will give you a equals q naught over 40, 2 plus nu d. And your approximate displacement is equal to q naught over 40, 2 plus nu d x y 1 minus x minus y. And from this expression here, you can estimate the displacement at any point uh, of the plate. So as you can easily see, it's a fairly straightforward procedure, just a bunch of integrals. And the only complication is if the shape is not easy, you have to spend some time thinking about how you're going to evaluate your double integrals. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is to just go ahead and integrate directly. If you have a more involved geometry, you might need to use some of the tricks that you have learned in, in, in calculus in order to simplify the integrals and be able to uh, calculate uh, the required coefficients. <coughs> the final thing we're going to do is what happens if we're talking about a buckling problem rather than a problem of statics. <laughs> Again, what we have shown at the end of our discussion on buckling is that the condition for buckling was obtained from delta u plus lambda vi equals 0, where vi was the potential energy of impaired forces, lambda was the load multiplier. <coughs> and vi was nothing other than one half integration over the plate nx wx squared plus ny wy squared plus 2 times nxy wx wy dx dy. And u 
same expression as before. So we already know that if we make the Rolleritz assumption, which is simply that the mode shape in this case, rather than the static deflection, the buckling shape is just summation over i, a i, <coughs> phi i is function of x and y. Then we already know that displace the strain energy based on this displacement assumption will take the form of one half a transpose k a, where a is the stiffness matrix. So this is already known. But if you look at this, you will see that, again, the potential energy of the in-plane loads itself is a quadratic function of displacement. So you will see from here that vi itself will be, can be written as minus one half e transpose another matrix, which we call a geometric matrix because you know uh, the in-plane, um, the potential energy of in-plane loads depends on w comma x, w comma y, which are the rotations of the mid uh, surface. So we think about this as the result of small changes in the shape of the plate, and that's why this matrix is sometimes called the geometric matrix times a, where kg itself, ij, is nothing other than minus integration nx phi i comma x phi j comma x plus ny phi i comma y phi j comma y plus nxy phi i comma x phi j comma y plus phi i comma y phi j comma x dx dy. And actually showing this is straightforward, again you substitute the summations. <coughs> In order to get a symmetric form, instead of working with this as 2nxy wx wy, you just rewrite this term here as nxy wx wy, which gives you the first term that appears here, plus nxy wy wx, which would give you the second term appearing here. So this is just an, uh, an algebraic trick to find a symmetric representation of, of the matrix, so that Essentially, if you switch i and j, you get exactly the same expression. But other than that, it's actually very simple. So now, if you minimize u uh, plus lambda vi, you end up with k minus lambda kg times a equals 0, which is an eigenvalue problem. And actually, we define kg with a negative sign, mainly because um, standard eigenvalue problems have a minus sign rather than a plus sign in the definition. So essentially, all what you need to do for buckling problems is to compute your stiffness matrix, which is the same thing you would do as for <coughs> the same thing that you would do uh, for um, <coughs> excuse me, for statics, but you also need to calculate the geometric matrix, which is also straightforward to compute, at least in this case, and solve this eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalues will give you the buckling multipliers, and of course the lowest one will be the most critical, and the corresponding eigenvectors will give you the buckling shapes. So that's about it for Rolleritz method. It is one of the most versatile methods 
for solving um, easy idealized problems. If the geometry is sufficiently simple so that we can satisfy all geometric boundary conditions with reasonably assumed functions, it's a very straightforward way of finding approximate solutions. As we have more and more terms in the assumed series, we get better and better accuracy. One interesting aspect of the Rolleritz technique, actually, uh, also is that <coughs> you can use this also to derive finite elements. So the simplest finite elements were obtained uh, by similar technique. The only difference is that instead of assuming shape functions over the whole structure, you assume these functions over a single element, and then sum the contribution of the energy from all elements in order to set up your complete system. And this summation corresponds to the assembly procedure in finite element uh, in the finite element method. Of course, finite element method ends up way more complicated than just Rolleritz method, because Rolleritz techniques requires the satisfaction of all geometric constraints. Sometimes it's not easy to satisfy all of these. And for this reason, people come up with all kinds of additional tricks and more complicated uh, variational principles in order to uh, construct their finite elements. But at least as a basic technique, there are many elements which can be derived by this method. For example, the standard uh, Hermitian beam element can be derived this technique. Uh, the standard truss uh, element in 2D and 3D can be derived uh, with this technique. 